Hi everyone, I'm the Plant Propagator and welcome to my channel. Today it is a beautiful morning here in Southwest Florida and although I have orchids all around me, um, I'm not going to talk about them very much <laughs> today. Um, what I want to do is share with you these guys and uh, talk a little bit about uh, where they come from and what they are and, and, and how they were made. And so these are genetically engineered petunias. So this is, uh, these are the firefly petunia from Light Bio. And these have been, it's, uh, it's a really an interesting story. I was just really delighted to, to hear about this. These are available for purchase and for use. Uh, and this is a, a bioluminescent petunia. Uh, the, the story behind this is really interesting. So this is, uh, these have been in the making for many, many uh, years. And there's a long history behind the production of, of transgenic plants and transgenic uh, petunia and and flowers, not so much. So most of the uh, the transgenic, the biotech products, are in the fields in the United States as well as worldwide. And those are what I worked on for the majority of, of my career. Um, so, and they're, the, the genes that are in, introduced into these transgenic plants are quite varied. Uh, in the initial days, it was, there's herbicide resistance, uh, but, but um, this has really changed uh, over time to include a variety of different genes that are for, you know, increased productivity, um, modification of the quality of the, uh, the product that was produced by the plant. And then more recently here, um, what, we, what we have is aesthetics. I, I, did, I should mention also there's, you know, there's increased resistance to um, various pests, um, you know, viruses, uh, fungi, uh, all types of different resistance. It, it, it improves the quality of the plant and it improves the, you know, the vigor of the plant and the ability of the plant to fight certain pests. Um, and there's, there's quality characters, a number of different genes have been introduced into many different plants. Before plants like this can be provided to the public, they have to be what's called deregulated. They have to go in front of um, government agencies and be evaluated and tested for years and years and years. And that's called um, regulatory and it's these plants are deregulated which means they're open uh, for sale and, and it's a really it's a long process there's there's a lot of information that has to be presented to prove that this plant that the transgenes introduced that's not going to be released not going to be uh, transposed into other plants and that the plant itself is safe for in the case of consumption or use or for whatever whatever purpose. Um, these tomatoes have been uh, tomatoes. These petunias have been engineered uh, to contain a, a gene for bioluminescence. They're called the firefly bioluminescence, but the genes that the two genes for luminescence that these plants have received and now contain and pass from integrated in the DNA and pass from generation to generation, they come from a, a mushroom, a, a fungus, and it, it's really an interesting story. So what I want to do is tell you a little bit about the, uh, you know, the history behind these. We'll, we'll take a look at them. They are bioluminescent. Um, there's, you know, there, there's, it's really incredible to look at things. I've had these plants, they don't, they don't look great, but I've had them outside, planted outside here. Not plant, they're in pots, but I've had them outside here. And I come out at night and look at them and it's, it's eerie. It's very cool to see these, these plants that were the flowers and more the immature flowers kind of glow at night. Anyway, back to the history of these things. So um, the initial bioluminescence was from fireflies. So there was a, a, a gene called luciferase that was um, cloned from firefly that was introduced into plant. The problem with those, that first attempt at bioluminescence is that you had to feed 
the plants luciferin, or you had to take cuttings of the plants and feed them luciferin, which is the substrate for luciferase. So you get the two things together, and then they would cause luminescence. Um, and there's so so the initial it was just kind of interesting. But even in the early days, what happened? is that the plants were luminescence, but it wasn't the bright firefly pulse that you typically see. Um, these, you could only see the bioluminescence if you took these things into a dark room, um, used special cameras that would do a long time, a long exposure image collection. You couldn't really see what was going on. So in the early days, you wanted to use these types of uh, genes. These are called marker genes that would mark the cells and the tissues that contain the gene, you couldn't really use them very effectively because you had to do a, such a long-term exposure. You couldn't see them in real time. You couldn't hold it up and, and say, look, I see it here. Even if you would go in a dark room and, and let your, in a completely dark room and let your eyes adjust, you couldn't see in the, in the old days, you couldn't see any kind of gene expression. You couldn't see the luciferase activity or the luminescence. Um, over time, marker genes have changed. I worked for the bulk of my career on the jellyfish green fluorescent protein, and that's, that's fluorescence, which is different from luminescence that's occurring here. So in the, in the fluorescence, what happens is you would shine a light, a very high intensity, usually a, like a UV type light, but more high intensity blue light onto the tissue and the plants would fluoresce this really nice green color. It was, it's fluorescent green, there's no question. That's what the color was. And then you could see that in real time, but you needed a, uh, a light source that would really put out high intensity light. And then you would also need filters and screens because what happens is that this was such a high intensity light, the chlorophyll, don't mean to complicate things too much, but the chlorophyll within the tissue also fluoresces red. So you've got a combination of red fluorescence and green fluorescence, and you'd have to have filters in a, in a microscope setup in order to see what's going on, but you could see it in real time. So throughout my career, I worked on the green fluorescent protein. So, I, so these are some, uh, some movies, and I have some images also of what the green, of what green fluorescence looks like in genetically engineered plant tissue. And, and again, the exciting thing about this is that you could see it in real time. Now, what I did is I used the fluorescence in order to evaluate different components of the genes that I introduced to see what would give the highest expression or what would give expression in certain tissue. And again, the real advantage is that you could see it in, in real time. And that was one. And you could see pretty low levels depending on the setup that you have, and I had a nice setup, you could see very low levels of gene expression, which would let you dissect a lot of things that you couldn't normally see. Okay, so back to this. So this is luminescence. What was the breakthrough here? So the breakthrough here was the cloning and the identification of the genes from the, the, the mushroom that could be transferred into plants that could give you real-time expression and real time so you could actually see the luminescence itself. The, the difference between this is that and the, and the earlier luminescence is that you didn't have to add any products. So the plant produces most of the products that, that are needed in order to see the luminescence. Two additional genes were introduced that would, that from the fungus that would let you see uh, luminescence in this tissue. There are other, there's another gene that was introduced that's also for, uh, that allows you to select this tissue uh, in, in tissue culture, but the main thing is that the luminescence is, is visible only by the introduction of two different genes because all of the other genes that are needed to produce this luminescent product are present in plants. And so this is the real advantage. Now, what I should also say is that the, uh, the genes in the process in these plants have been protected. The patent just came out, the US patent just came out. It was um, published in 2024. 
Uh, so it is, it's, it's in place, so you're not allowed to, um, you know, propagate and sell these plants. You can make a few, I think, for yourself. Um, but it's still a, it's a really nice and interesting product. And there is, you know, in the advertising for the, the, this Firefly Petunia, there are, there are images and movies that are taken that apparently are very sensitive to the low amount of luminescence that these plants produce. So it's not bright right now. It's not going to light up your backyard or your ground or your neighborhood. You're not going to use it to replace floodlights that you happen to have lining a walkway. Uh, and I also should say that these plants are white flowering petunias. They don't do uh, really well here. There may be some other um, petunias that do well in different locations where you'll get, where it'll work a little bit better. Uh, there may be other ways to regulate the genes that were introduced to get higher expression of those genes. I did contact the CEO of the company and ask for clarification on things, and he has not yet responded, but I was, I was excited to have these, and I'm excited to make this video. So I just decided to move ahead without hearing from him, and maybe, maybe he'll contact me after, uh, after seeing, seeing what I've done. Um, but there may be ways to increase expression so that this is um, brighter. Right now this is in Petunia and it took an effort to what's called again deregulate to get this approved for commercialization in the U.S. Uh, through the, um, it's the Animal and, APHIS, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, which is part of the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, to approve these for commercialization. Every different plant that is where these genes are introduced, uh, the patent covers them but the uh, ability to commercialize these has to go through this federal agency. So every different plant that's done, you have to get approval for this. And I bring this up because what happens if you're going to introduce this into another plant, like let's say, for example, orchids? Well, um, you know, the interesting thing is that it, it would be a really, I think it would be a great product to have a luminescent orchid. The gene here happens to express at high levels in the flowers and with orchids that's where you want to go. Uh, this is a white flowering petunia because there may be interference from pigmented petunias with a luminescent but luckily in orchids and especially in Phalaenopsis there's lots of white flowering Phalaenopsis that are available. Um, the, you know, to have it inside in your house at night and have a luminescent glow from a um, firefly phalaenopsis, I think that would be great. Um, but I don't know whether they'd generate this product. Of the orchids, phalaenopsis would be a good target because it flowers quickly from seed, because there's infrastructure in place to generate tons of this. You know, I went to Green Circle Growers and they generate, you know, they got Mother's Day coming up. They generate a million plants a day for Mother's Day. It's, it's um, you know, imagine, the, so the infrastructure's in place, the, the ability to introduce genes are placed, the genes are available. So it, to introduce these, I think, into a white phalaenopsis, I think would be, would be a great thing. You still have to deregulate. You still have to get approval to, to utilize that. And I think what they're doing is they want to see how this sells and how popular this is before they look at other markets. And they are looking at other markets. So they're looking at other potted plants. They're looking for landscape plants to, to provide a glow uh, in that situation. Um, but I, you know, I don't know how, you know, I don't know how, how much brighter this is going to get. There is, because there's brightness, because there is light that's put out, there's an energy requirement, okay? Nothing comes for free. And this light, like I said, is mostly produced on the immature flowers in, in this plant. And it does require a small amount of energy input in order to produce this glow. Now, the plants can afford it. Um, you know, they do it. These guys are doing well. After I receive these from shipping, I repotted them right away. And there, there's a flush of growth that's going on. So I think if you have a nice, rapidly growing plant, you're going to get, uh, you know, a reasonable amount of luminescence that I think can be increased through an optimization 
of the of the gene expression that you see with this or if you want to try this in a, in a phalaenopsis. All right, so um, I just wanted to share you share these uh, with you. Uh, again, I've taken these in the in the in the dark uh, inside my house, but even outside the house where there's, I have neighbors that have some lights that they leave on all night. Even with that, you can still see the glow. <laughs> it's very cool. I, I like this. You can buy these. These are commercially available. They're really expensive for a petunia. They won't be as expensive for an orchid, but it's a really unique thing that I'm enjoying at least experimenting with and, uh, and playing with and looking at and sharing with you and some of my neighbors that tolerate me and my interests. All right, so that's all I have for today. I'm, I'm happy to introduce you to the, uh, to the Firefly Petunia from Light Bio. I hope you enjoyed my video today. If you did and you want to keep on seeing them, it would help me out if you can click on like, share, and subscribe to my channel if you're not already a subscriber. All right, that's all I have for you today again. I hope you enjoyed it and happy propagating.